Chapter 27 Garn's Grange Hale's world was swirling darkness. The cries of men, the clash of arms, were replaced by the rush of water, the roar of rapids, and this hiss of froth. He tumbled through tunnels with sides that had been smoothed by centuries of flow. There were no handholds, no pools to surface in, only swiftly moving subterranean darkness, without air, without light. More than once he was thrown up against a boulder or other barrier of some sort, the force so great that he was sure he had broken a rib. It became near impossible to hold his breath. His lungs burned as if doused in acid. The darkness that surrounded him subsumed into his consciousness. If he did not gasp for air soon, he would surely black out and the result would be the same. And then the water was still, and he floated to the surface and air, wonderful air was on his face, bubbling in the water and blessedly in his lungs. He took in great mouthfuls of it while the current carried him under an archway of stone and into light. The water grew shallower, and he felt himself bump along the gravelly bottom. A figure of fur and steel loomed over him, snagged his collar, and soon the elk was drawing him to a rocky shore where Caitlin was laying, her chest rising and falling, her hair a mess of wet tangles. Hale took in deep gulps of air while lying beside her. He said nothing. Instead, they listened as the elk stalked back into the water, the current eddying about its long legs while it pulled Cody, then Val, from the water and placed them on a rocky ledge a little further downstream. The four of them safe, the elk returned to a spot next to Caitlin where it folded its legs and sat, waiting as they recovered. Hale did not feel inclined to move. His eyes stared up at the blue sky, his heart still pounding in his chest. He could feel his pulse in his neck, and hear it in his ears. The elk tore at some grass growing out between two rocks and began to snack on it. Why did you do it? Hale asked. Do what? Caitlin said. Reach out. Help him, Hale said, knowing he did not need to mention Vondale's name. Especially after what he did to you. Caitlin held up her healed hand. Nothing short of a miracle, yet neither of them knew just how it had happened, just that whatever it had taken to save her had cost the font, cost Jasmine, the extent of her powers. I didn't do it for him. I did it for me. I still don't understand. I didn't want to be like him. I got to thinking about what Val and the Knights of Oban would say. All life is precious, even your enemies. If I had watched him die without trying to help, I would have been no different than him. Hale thought on it a while. I guess I'm not that different. I wanted him to die. But you still tried to help. Only because you did. She laid her hand on his. That is all that matters. Hale could have stayed there longer. He could have slept until the next dawn, but Val and Cody eventually crawled up the rocks, dripping, exhausted. <sighs> it's best we move out before it gets dark, Val said, still breathless. He looked at the elk, chewing grass. <laughs> Some elk. I'll say, Cody echoed. We can camp tonight farther down the mountain. It will be warmer. Then we need to make for Rivertown. I know just the place where we can stay, Hale said. Lorna, Sorel, and all the other members of the house staff welcomed them to River Ridge, bringing them changes of clothes, hot food and tea, and bandages for their wounds. While Lorna rubbed a salve on Hale's forehead, she asked, Did you find the healing you were looking for? Hale thought carefully, his skin tingling from the salve. Yes and no. The font, it worked, but I used my wish for someone else. After you rest, you four can tell me the story in its entirety. The next morning, after sleeping late and partaking of a large breakfast, that was exactly what they did. Val, Cody, and Caitlin filled in the gaps, explaining how Red had traded them to Vondales. He and that sod fellow were brothers, I figure, Cody said. Aye, by the look of them. What happened to Sod? Val asked. I don't know. He fell into the water, but who knows where it carried him, Hale said. A silence settled over the table and Hale felt cold even with the morning sun streaming in through the window. At the least, I think the Red Mots won't be causing trouble for us again. Cody pulled an imaginary dagger and gave a smile. I didn't see where Red went, Caitlin frowned. Lest gloom settle over all of them, Lorna began to clear the plates from the table and signal to Sorel. Refresh our friend's teacups. Then you lot ought to sit out in the sun, soak in its warmth, 
and dispel the cold of the mountains from your bones. They followed her instructions. Cody wandered down to the bank of the Liam where some young women were beating laundry. Their laughter reached Hale, Caitlin, and Val where they had taken seats on the gallery, facing the shining sun and the mountains in the east. Val shook his head and grumbled something into his teacup before he got up and walked across the swale of grass to the riverbank to retrieve Cody. For a while, Hale and Caitlin sat in silence, listening to the chirping birds and the crowing of a rooster in some unseen courtyard. The ladies along the water bade Cody a farewell in high, sing-song voices as Val drew him back toward the main house. Such a nice place, Caitlin said. Really? It seems empty to me, like the heart's been torn out of it. Hale said, looking on the windows behind him that caught the sunlight, sunlight that shone into empty rooms. Lorna called it a place of mourning. Caitlin shrugged and sipped her tea. Mourning? Despair? Someone once told me those sad things make up the soil in which the seed of hope germinates. You've come back to life as a philosopher, Caitlin, Hale smiled. I'll settle for friend. Hale looked into his cup, his countenance darkening. What's wrong? Did I say something to upset you? Caitlin touched his arm. I've done wrong to many people on this journey, and I've been lucky to make things right with some, but not all. Gone? Yes. I wonder if he has survived his wounds. There is one way to find out, Caitlin said. We need to be moving back west to the city anyhow. True, Hale said, draining his cup and looking over the river that sparkled like beaten gold, the mist rising like smoke from Festos and finally the mountains mingling with clouds so that sky and earth were indistinguishable. But there is a part of me that wishes we could stay here forever. Lorna accompanied them back along the trade road, riding on horses Yana herself had broken. With their wild flight and two captivities, it was not easy to find the way back to Garn's Grange, but the elk was with them and proved to have a knack for finding the way, not unlike a bloodhound on a trail. So it was on the evening of their third day out that they turned off the main road, down a lane lined with hedgerows, and emerged on a familiar homestead. The children, whether they were Garns or his farmhands, were first to spot them, staring wide-eyed at the elk who led the way. By the time the group reached the main house, Garn's wife was waiting in the doorway, flanked by her helpers. She was stone-faced, her expression a mix of resentment and worry, not welcome. Hale dismounted and dropped to a knee. My lady, we owe you a debt, he said. You are bold to return. If my husband were not ill, he would run you off. I wish that I could. Then he lives still, Caitlin said. No thanks to those of you who took advantage of him. Lorna had already slipped down from her saddle, drawn her medicine kit from the saddlebags, and slung it over her shoulder. She marched towards the door without slowing and without waiting for invitation. I will allow you all to work out your amends. In the meantime, let me see to my patient. Something in her bearing moved Garn's wife to step aside, allowing this indomitable woman with amulets of silver and bone to walk into her home. Hale was ready to wait, but Lorna called after him. Come, Hale. Sorel is not here, so you will have to serve as my assistant. They found Garn in the same room, under the same windows as Aurora had been. Father seemed ready to follow daughter to the land of shade, for he had grown thin, his complexion waxy, and the skin around his wounds red and inflamed. Lorna clucked her tongue as she peeled back the bandages and examined the tears that the dogs had left in Garn's flesh. His wife stood in the doorway, her hands balled into fists at her sides. Val and the others had followed her and stood behind her in the hallway. We beg of you, my lady, an opportunity to set things right, Val said. Lorna is a skilled healer, he lifted his own sleeve to show a fresh bandage she had changed just that morning. She has helped us with our injuries. This will take all my skill and some luck as well, Lorna said, shedding her cloak and rolling her sleeves. She touched Garn's forehead. His eyes fluttered, lost in a fever dream. Hale, hand me the maiden, Wart. Caitlin, fetch me some water. She looked to Garn's wife. Something in Lorna's expression asked the question for her. My name is Mary Lee, Garn's wife said. Merrily, boil some wine and find me some moldy bread. The wine and moldy bread made a concoction that smelled of vinegar and rotten stockings, but after bathing Garn's wounds in it, the redness began to subside. 
Lorna put Hale to work grinding rosemary, whorehound, and saxifrage in a mortar, then mixed the powder with flaxseed oil that she spooned into Garn's mouth. She massaged his throat until he swallowed it and then instructed Hale to squeeze out cherries and reduce the juice to a syrup over a brazier. Lorna stirred in ginger water and tinctures of chalk from her medicine kit. Caitlin tended to the children of the farm while Val and Cody helped by doing chores normally left for the man of the house, chopping wood, baling hay, and repairing shingles on the roof in preparation for winter. So much help did they provide that some afternoons before she started to prepare dinner, Merrily would be free to sit in the sunroom with Hale while he changed the moist cloths on Garn's head. With time, her disposition towards him softened. So you are truly a prince, related to the king, she said one afternoon. Yes, Hale said, unsure how to react. Merrily crossed her legs and arms and leaned her head back upon a cushion. Hale was glad she seemed at ease. The last thing he wanted was for her to treat him differently, especially in her own home. You were born in a storm, she said, not taking her eyes from her husband. I was. It was from whence I was named. My father said I should be named after the bite of the storm. Hmm, she said, resting her chin on her hand and turning her gaze to Hale. Garn thought you were a healer because there are legends about a storm-born prince. There are? Yes. Superstitions, you city folk would call them. Nothing the Inquisitors would approve of. I've come to realize I am no friend of Inquisitors, Hale said. The stories say the storm-born prince would have power, that he would be a healer, she said, now resting her hand on Garn's, who twitched in his sleep. I pray it is true. Hale reflected on her words and for a moment remembered the cloud of flame that enveloped him without burning him, and Saad's words, You have the gift of power. But before he could reply, Lorna entered. Enough idleness, she said. Hale, where is your pestle and mortar? Garn finally woke after four days of ministering to him. It was early morning. The house was quiet but for the creak of the floor as Hale sat up in his chair, rubbing sleep from his eyes. The stars still hung over the trees. Hale stared out through the window panes at the vast purple sky and then back at the sleeping form of a giant man lit by candlelight. A man who stirred and was no longer sleeping. <clears throat> Water, Garn croaked. Hale scooted his chair back and rushed for a calabash and held it next to Garn's lips. He drank, the lump in his throat dipping with each swallow. When he opened his eyes, he focused on Hale and he spoke in a stronger voice. You. Yes, Hale said, looking up from under his brows. Am I dying? No, I think you will live. Hale smiled and offered him more water. Thanks to Lorna. Who is that? A healer, a friend who has been aiding you. Yet I wake to you, he said, his mouth twisted, quizzical. I've been her assistant. Would you like me to get merrily? She will be pleased to know you are awake. Yes, but wait. Why did you return? Hale put down the calabash and rubbed his palms across his knees. I cannot make your family whole again, but I can try to leave things better than they were when I left you. You helped us, after all. Garn nodded, his lips working against one another as if he was chewing a thought. Whatever it was, he kept to himself. Hale crossed the room to the doorway. I'll get your wife. Merrily was just rising, starting the fire in the fireplace in the kitchen when Hale found her. Her face was still lined from her pillow, but she straightened fully awake when Hale told her, God has awoken. In the growing light of dawn, Hale could see her tears drop from her face as she leaned over her husband, whose eyes were still too dry for tears, but the expression on his face was unmistakable joy. Oh, a long night has passed, Lorna said from behind Hale in the doorway. He jumped a little. He had not heard her creep up next to him. Your powers compare to Jasmine's, Hale said, leaning against the door jamb. You exaggerate and you know it. Hale reached for Lorna's hand. This gives us leave now to return home. It gives you leave, and leave you must. Why not yourself? Yorna would want to see you. Would she? I doubt that. She might not want the reminder of a life that is past. I have no doubt she loves us, but we only remind her of what she lost. A past she can't get back. But you, she said, touching Hale's cheek, you are the future. You are the promise. Dizzy with lack of sleep 
and still wearing an apron from his last session of grinding cherry pits for Lorna's potions, Hale hardly felt promising. Really, he felt tired and said so, rubbing his eyes. You will have no time to rest, Lorna said, her tone firm. You must leave today. Your father marches to war and your place is beside him. He is in grave danger. Hale turned back to the reunion between Garn and Merrily and blinked his burning eyes. How do you know this? I saw it in a dream. Hale twisted his mouth as if he was sucking a lemon. He resisted what first came to his mind regarding superstitions, old wives' tales, and the inexact science of interpreting dreams. But as if she read his mind, Lorna gave his face a gentle slap. Have you not learned by now that there are powers unseen, forces at work that are beyond your ken, forces that folk of our kingdom fear? I have. But dreams? I have dreams, but they don't necessarily come true. You tell Yorna that I saw your father march to war amid banners and a host of a thousand men. But he is surrounded by death and danger, and only you might be able to save him. Then listen to what she says. You are sure you won't come with us? No. My place is here with my patient. But for you, it is with your friends, and it is time for all of you to depart.